I've been promising for some time to do a uh, video about the wrath of God and about the rapture. And I think it's important to uh, note that really the rapture is about the wrath of God. This kind of kicks off everything and, and we'll pull everything together. And then as we progress from Old Testament into New Testament, as is very often the case, you will find a, a sequence where what God does frequently with prophecy is he builds on it and gives more and more information so that by the time we're done, we've got the whole picture. Um, it, as whole as it can be, without well, actually um, arriving at that time where the prophecy is being fulfilled. But this, this, is, this is common. Um, now, many people will look at some of these prophetic events and they will say that um, many of these events are symbolic and some of, the, of these passages that are apocalyptic are symbolic. Um, but then I, I like to point out that there are so many passages in the Old Testament, as we are aware, about Christ's first coming. And I like to ask the question, how many of those Old Testament passages about Christ's first coming were fulfilled symbolically and not actually? How many of them were figuratively fulfilled? And the answer is zero. They were all literally fulfilled. So why should we all, said, all of a sudden take at the leap mentally that the paradigm God uses is going to shift for the second coming. And now all of a sudden, so many of these prophecies that are uh, laid out for us in the New Testament and in the Old Testament about his second coming and his kingdom are all figurative, or so many of them are, any of them are figurative. If the ones in the Old Testament concerning his first coming were not figurative. So um, the best approach is to Assume a normal, regular reading of the scriptures of the text, unless we have precedence to understand it differently. So, with that, let's look at, at the um, arguably the, the mother of all passages that starts, that kicks this whole thing off with questions about um, what the 70 weeks of Daniel is, and particularly that controversial 70th week of Daniel. And um, why is it that there's discussion about a rapture before the 70th week? Why is there discussion about the wrath of God? What is so special about this week? Why is there discussion and controversy about how long that week is and whether or not that week is the tribulation? So I'm going to kind of hit some of my favorite passages that I think are um, in, in my mind, are um, inarguable, and I, I know somebody's going to argue with me about that now, but uh, they are, you can stick a pin in them, and they are what they say unless you want to symbolize them away or read into it some weird figurative language that frankly isn't there. Um, if there is anything figurative, we'll address that and we'll look at it and we'll see why we, uh, we understand it um, in some other way. So anyway. Uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 9, remember that Daniel is, is praying, and he's praying on behalf of Israel. We skip ahead to verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God, for the holy hill of my God, which is in Jerusalem, right, Zion, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. And the man, Gabriel, is obviously an angel. Angel means messenger, so obviously he is the angel Gabriel. He made me under, understand speaking with me, saying, Oh, Daniel, I've now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. We, then we, he's going to give him the 70 weeks prophecy. 
So here we have 70 weeks right off the bat that we're to watch for and understand. 70 weeks are decreed about your people, Israel, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, which happens the second coming and going into the kingdom, to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince there shall be seven weeks. And we can get into all the minutia of the 70 weeks and the 69 weeks. We're not here to do that right now. It's an interesting study, but that will take more time than I intend to take here right now. I encourage you to do that. Um, a lot of good Bible teachers out there um, who do that. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in troubled times. And this is historically what happened with Israel after they were um, captive and then they were um, released to go ahead and, and uh, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, all of that. And after 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now we're going to, that's it's a lot of words, a lot of big words about desolation and so forth, so... Drink up, get a sip of coffee or whatever you need. Let's take a look at what this means. Now, some people will try to say that um, the people of the princes to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary uh, because they want to get to that point where they try to say that Jesus is the fulfillment of that and he's the one who ended sacrifices in the temple. Well, to do that, you got to say he that the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, um, Jesus was not in the Roman Empire. Are you mean that Antichrist, when he comes, is going to be there um, and uh, um, come out of the old Roman Empire? Um, he's still going to be a Jew. We've discussed this. You talk to rabbis today. They have priesthood over there now. And if you ask them, and I encourage you to do this, write them email saying. Who's the Messiah going to be? Who are you looking for in the Messiah as far as qualifications for Messiah? And I have done this. Now, here's the qualifications they're looking for. With the exception of one liberal who doubted the whole thing, that it even matters or whatever, um, all of the other rabbis that I communicated with in one form or another said they are looking for one uh, of the tribe of Judah. He also must be of a line of David. So those two qualifications right there means he will not be a Gentile. He will not be a Muslim. He must be a Jew. You have tribe of Judah, line of David, and he will bring us our temple. This, these are the three things they um, all agreed to without, without a skip, any one of them, without exception. All right, so he comes out of that area. He's also known as uh, the Assyrian, not to be confused with Syrian. Um, uh, what's a uh, a particular group of people who live in Syria, but Assyria is the Assyrian Empire. It was also um, the Roman Empire and also Babylon, and they're all covered. You look at maps, and you look at the overlay, and there's a lot of overlap between those ancient um, peoples, those ancient empires, and how they overlapped the Middle East. So whoever this is is going to come out of something that is um, the, of the old Assyrian region, empire, also the Roman Empire, and he's going to be a Jew. So desol desolations are decreed, um, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Uh, some people will somehow try to say that that was Jesus, but it's not, you know, whatever. Jesus didn't make a – those arguments are dead end for so many reasons. Um, 
they try to split this and, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half a week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So they try to say, well, Jesus' ministry was maybe about, okay, it was it was maybe three and a half years. So that's the half of a week and he puts an end to, no, he doesn't fulfill any of that. Whatever happened to the other three and a half weeks? So they want to mock, a lot of times they want to mock breaking up that 70th week of Daniel that we're talking about here and throwing it into the future. But then they'll turn around and take this other three and a half week So that's a little little dishonest there, and it it clouds it clouds a lot more than what it has to be. So it, does Jesus fulfill, fulfill that? Um, so to clarify, who the des, who's doing the desolating, who's stopping the sacrifices, and so forth? Um, we can we can take a quick look to clarify that. And for that, I encourage us now to go to um, we take a quick hop over to Matthew chapter twenty four. Look at the, the heading we have here, the abomination of desolation. So here Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he's giving his Olivet Discourse um, because his disciples asked him a threefold question way up here at the beginning. Um, they come out of the temple. he just given them, given a big talk in chapter 23, and it's the same talk that he gives in the Olivet Discourse sermon that's in Luke. So he comes out of the temple now. He's not he's no longer in the temple. He's not... Um, not in, in it anymore, and the disciples come out with him, and they're looking at the uh, grounds, and so he sits down on the Mount of Olives, and he's resting now after the big sermon. Disciples came to him privately. Actually, four of them did, and the four are listed in Mark chapter fourteen: Peter, James, J Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Um, they come to him and they ask him a threefold question. They say, "Tell us, uh, when will be when will these things be?" And what will be the sign of your coming? So Jesus gives them a whole bunch of signs and um, of the end of the age. So Jesus is going to answer this in the order given. Now he talks about the end and he mentions the end and he mentions the second coming. In so many terms he mentions the end some 13 times in this chapter. So it's not a complete chronology because you don't have 13 endings. So he gives a little bit and then he backs up. And he clarifies, because there are multiple events going on um, at the same time, and to answer this threefold question, this is the way he chooses to do it. So now, flash forward here, we're going to, I've got a series of, of um, videos um, that you can look at down below on Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Take a look at those. I, I still need to get into Matthew 25, which continues the Olivet Discourse. So I will get to that, um, Lord willing. Look at verse 15, though, Matthew chapter 24. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That doesn't sound like Jesus is talking about himself, does it? So he's talking about the abomination of desolation. Jesus isn't calling himself an abomination that makes desolate either. So we can't go into... Daniel 9, 27, and try to say that this is all talking about Jesus. Um, some people will try to say this is about Nero or, or one, um, you know, leader or emperor or, or another, or one Caesar or another. Um, but none of them fulfilled this. Um, on the contrary, instead of standing in the holy place and um, desecrating the temple, um, the army came in and burned it down. They didn't go inside of there because it was burning. They destroyed it. Um, and so he's saying when um, it, it, that was a near fulfillment, and it was a destruction of the temple, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, these things must happen, where the Lord says, uh, as judgment on you, you've killed the prophets, and I'm going to scatter, scatter you to all the countries. I'm going to scatter you into the nations. Well, this is what happened in 70 AD. The rest of the passage, as we discuss in the Matthew series that's attached below, explains why um, that was not about all of it, about 70 AD and the reason why. But let's take a look at this. He, he's, he's telling him you have to flee. You've got to go. Don't even return for your cloak. Hit the road. So we'll get into what when this was. So, 
when this is supposed to ha happen, when the fulfillment of this is written down, okay? Um, verse 20, look at this, pray your flight um, may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then shall be great tribulation. So Jesus is tying this with the abomination that makes desolation, um, makes desolate him standing in the holy place. He's tying it to this time that's called Great Tribulation. Okay, now when is that? Was that 70 AD? And this here explains why it couldn't have been 70 AD and how it's a particular place and time that we have not seen yet. And how do we know? He says, for then, verse 21, there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No and never will be. Not 70 AD, because both world wars were much worse and massive and destructive in scope, including to the Jews and, and Jerusalem, than 70 AD was. So we've had 70 AD, we've had both world wars, and this is supposed to be the worst time ever. So both world wars so far are the worst time ever. So we're waiting for something still bigger and worse. Okay, so this is future. I know people's hair want to go on fire and so forth, and, and those in the amillennial camp and in the reform camp, which I'm in the reform camp, but I'm also dispensational. Um, but it's this is something that's future. And uh, it says in here, too, it's so bad if those days had not been cut short, then no human being would be saved. But for the the elect's sake, those days will be cut short. No, he's not going to shorten the days from 20 hours, 24 hours to 20 hours to 18 hours to do something weird. Those days are going to be cut short by his coming. So we're on the path to destruction. Things are about ready to go nuclear. Armageddon's happening, and he steps down from heaven. So those days are cut short. Otherwise, there would be no mortals left on earth at all, and everybody would be toast, quite literally, really, when you, you get into the bold judgments in uh, at the toward the end of the book of Revelation. So, so now uh, we had Gabriel tell Daniel about a, a unique mid marker, and Jesus just now codified that. So he's saying, "So when you see this time, so obviously Jesus is in it, and, and he adds to it and says that, well, no, not only that, but it's going to be bad because uh, we have this uh, abomination of desolation standing in the holy place." Um, in the middle of the week. In the middle of the week was also described in um, you know, Daniel 9.27, and Jesus also just, just described it here and said it's going to be, you know, it's going to be just as described from Gabriel to Daniel. So he confirms this. Let's, um, let's also, I'm going to take this away here a second. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we're going to get into first. Thessalonians, um, chapter 1, briefly, chapter 4 and 5, um, uh, and look at some things. But I'm going to try to show you the, the this particular week, week of years. So Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, I have this time frame that I'm going to tell you about that really is the whole future uh, about your people and the city uh, of your people and so forth. And it's going to go from one end to the other, and, and here's the whole thing, and it's in 70 weeks. And here's a segment of, of time here, and there are weeks of years. A week, and I, I can't stress this enough, so I don't stress it I, um, too much. I, in my opinion, I, I might overstress it, but it's a week is kind of like the term dozen. And we in the Western world, Western culture, we know dozen means 12. Um, so it's a grouping of 12. So uh, a, a week is a grouping of seven. Obviously, we're talking years. I don't think anybody would dispute and think that it means actually weeks. It's, it's a groupings of seven, but it's groupings of weeks of years. So when you take these times, these 70 weeks of Daniel, and you, you split them up and you get all the way to the 69th week, you've got Jesus actually coming in and entering into um you know, uh, it, the mathematics works out where he comes into Jerusalem. And you also have him being cut off, which is also language that's in Daniel chapter 9. I'm, I'm going to say again, you should study that. But 
You have language where he is cut off. Cut off is a term. It's a Hebraism that means killed. And when somebody is cut off, they're killed. So he's cut off. And then that 70th week does not happen. You have a, a, a near fulfillment. It's partial fulfillment, looks like. Um, kind of like, because you've got the destruction of the temple and all of that, but all of a sudden it's not it. And this happens in, in prophecy very often. As I like to point out, um, it ha happened in um, with Gabriel again when he spoke to Mary, and he told her about the child she was carrying and um, what he's going to do and how he's going to save people, and he's going to sit on the throne of David and rule with a rod of iron, that kind of thing, and you know he's going to have his kingdom. Well, that didn't all happen then. Um, Jesus himself did similarly when later on as an adult, he's in, he's in the sanctuary and he's opening the Isaiah scroll and he opens up to Isaiah and he in part reads a passage about himself and then he cuts off his reading at a comma and says, this day is this fulfilled in your hearing. And it confused everybody. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back. And folks were confused because he didn't finish the passage. And there's a very famous, very popular passage about the Messiah. But he said, this day is this fulfilled in your hearing, meaning that that much is so much there. But the part that Jesus left off with things that he's going to fulfill at his second coming. So this is the nature of, of uh, biblical prophecy often. So now we've got the 70 weeks and we're talking about the 69th week. Um, Jesus said, so when you see this coming, in other words, meaning that, this, the desecration of the temple in this way where somebody stands up and declares himself God and all this other kind of stuff is not, and stops the sacrifices, all this, this hasn't happened. The 69th week, or the 70th week stuff hasn't happened, only the 69th week stuff happens. Um, so then, we've got this, Paul visited, and we know from the, the, the first letter that he had this, these discussions about eschatology, um, and he said he was with them, so at some point he was preaching to them about this, and he wrote to them about this also in the first letter a little bit. So now, later on, somebody purporting to be an apostle or to have a letter that was from them, either from Paul or one of the other apostles, says, hey, look, I've got this letter from Paul, and it looks like we missed it. The day of the Lord has, has come. It's been here, and it's gone, and we missed it kind of a thing. So they're confused, and they're going, what's going on? And word gets back to Paul, and he writes this letter. So he, Paul says in chapter 2, now we ask you, brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed, whether by a spirit or word or letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it is not come unless the apostasy or the departure comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction so what's going to happen first is there's going to be a departure and there's also going to be a man of lawlessness is revealed um, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worships so that he takes his seat in the sanctuary of god so he goes into the temple Exhibiting himself as God, saying, I am God. So he exhibits himself as God. No, 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 it's me, it's God. Do not remember while I was still with you, I told you these things. So Second Thessalonians 2 is about the second coming. He says, no, this isn't the second coming. You didn't, you didn't know he's going to come again. Because Um, what does he say? He says, there's got to be a departure first or, or apostasia. Um, it comes first and then the man of lawlessness is revealed and that's in the middle of the tribulation, the son of destruction who opposes or he's revealed even at the beginning. Really he is, but they don't know he's the man of lawlessness yet and he hasn't gone into the temple yet. So he's revealed, son of destruction, um, when he sits in the temple and declares himself as God. So that's all that stuff's got to happen first. So no, Paul is saying that that hasn't happened yet. And he says, don't you remember when I was with you, um, the stuff that I told you about these things. And um, 
he says, um, verse 6, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, right? The spirit of Antichrist is already here. We got that before us to John also because the world's under judgment has been since the garden. So it's already at work, but it's being restrained by the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, he who now restrains will do it until he's taken out of the way. So who is everywhere in the world that can restrain all the evil in the world all at once? Who's powerful enough for that? Who's got the authority to do that? And who can be everywhere at once? So it's understood that this is the Holy Spirit, none other than. So the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and he's going to do that and taken out of the way in that ministry. God is everywhere. He's always everywhere. Um, and here, in this particular ministry that the Holy Spirit has as the restrainer, he's going to be taken out of the way in that particular ministry of restraining evil. And it's going to be, as the old saying goes, Katie, bar the door. It's going to be bad. So then we have great tribulation as Jesus spoke of. And I would also like to point out, um, as I've been challenged on before, is that somebody made a point of saying, you know, there is no seven-year tribulation because... You know, there are always trials. We're always going through tribulations in our lives. Even Jesus went through tribulations. Again, both Gabriel and Jesus affirmed that there is a particular time of tribulation, and Jesus called it great tribulation, where you have the 70th week of Daniel, and in the middle of the week, out. Um, it's going to be a time of great tribulation. So it's a particular time that, as Jesus said, is the worst that has ever happened from the beginning of the world. In Daniel nine twenty seven, so so Jesus confirms the events of Daniel nine twenty seven by mentioning spoken of by Daniel in the Great Tribulation. Paul then confirms those events and talks about this man, the same man of lawlessness, who uh, sits in the holy place and declares himself as God. Now we will see where these events actually are are lived out. In Revelation chapter 13, um, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems or crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. We also see this imagery in um, the previous chapter, chapter 12, and we understand that this is uh, the Antichrist now possessed by Satan because Satan in chapter 12 got kicked out of heaven by Daniel. There's been war in heaven going on all this time. And now finally, um, Satan and his demons are cast to the earth. No more access to the throne to accuse the saints, um, as is the language that is given to us in the passage. And um, so he's angry. He knows his time's short. So he goes off after the woman being Israel. As chapter 12 gives us the imagery that is given regarding Joseph and his dream that he gave to his father and his brothers that angered them. But it's the same imagery as the dream that uh, Joseph had in Genesis. The woman is Israel. So uh, the angel or, or the beast rising out of the sea, the best language to understand this is, is a Hebraism that is used often. The sea is a large number of people out of the sea of people. Did he literally come out of the ocean? There's also the possibility that you could say, too, from the perspective the Bible is written from uh, man's perspective uh, most times um, and in uh, our language and language written to us and language that we could understand and we understand that there's a horizon and that he might appear to come out of um, the sea um, you know out, out in the out in the west and come up and and uh, look where did he come from but I doubt that I think that's an interesting way to look at it that's Another perspective to say he literally came out of the sea. Um, but he's using symbolic language here that we understand from the previous chapter because we were told who the dragon is when we was also called the serpent. We, we were told in the previous chapter that he's Satan. And we see what he does. We, we're told in chapter 11 that he went after the, comes out of the sea or the massive, I think, 
that large population. He comes out of that number. He's the Assyrian comes out of that tribe. He's uh, comes out of the old Roman Empire, and it, um, he's also a, a Jew. So out of the Middle East, he comes out of a, the, the the numbers of people. He came out of nowhere. Um, we know this because he starts off also, and we see in Daniel as the little horn, and then he consumes a couple of horns. The next thing you know, he's he, he's this. He's now the big horn. And so where does the sky come from? So he comes out of nowhere. So he comes out of the sea. Um, and, and and this language, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's. So the dragon gave his power. So um, like, when we see the term like, that is an indicator or as, it's an indicator that it's figurative language. Um, it's like a, a tongue like a sword. It cuts, right? Eyes like a flame of fire, it's judgment. So like and as are, are keys that this could be figurative language here. And then it does tell us, as most figurative language in the Bible does, tells us tells us the meaning. This is similar, if you go back and study Daniel, to descriptors of ancient empires that came up through history that I'm not going to get into. Um, it's in, written in reverse order because in Daniel, it's looking, it's looking, Daniel's looking forward to this time here in Revelation, so it's in a different order, and it covers the empires through Israel's history in that order. Here, John is being, these um, empires are being looked at in reverse order, like back in time in history. But it's like that, but, but the, here's the difference, is it's not all these things happening um, separately. This one beast is like all those by himself. Um, the Antichrist, this leader that is possessed by Satan, is is like all those guys, um, but all unto himself. So that's how powerful he is. Uh, um, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, again, the Antichrist, possessed by Satan, for he had given his authority to the beast. So the dragon, Satan, gives his authority to the beast. He's got possessed um, the Antichrist. So he's got his uh, his authority. And they worship the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who can fight against it? Again, he's like all of those old empires in the past, lumped together into one. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Why? What happens after 42 months? 42 months is three and a half years, right? So we're talking about right here, we're at the beginning of the great tribulation Jesus is describing. So he's giving, uh, he's allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, that's the final three and a half years. Um, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemy, blasphemies against God, blasphemy in his name and his dwelling. So this is talking about in the, in the holy place. And um, all these events from Daniel 9, 27, and Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, watch out for this, because when you see this, um, and to those who dwell in heaven. So he's literally against God, his temple, and also all of us, all of us, because we're dwelling in heaven now at this point, because we are not here. The church, the bride of Christ, we are not here. But he's also uh, probably uttering against all the Old Testament saints who were before, all the people of God. And he's blaspheming and uttering against everybody. Also, it was allowed to make war. It's interesting that, that it's called here an it, and it is. The beast is an it because it's a human, but it's indwelt by Satan himself. So it's an it. So he's going to make war on the saints and to conquer them. So he's given permission to conquer the saints at that time. What, is the church going to be there? Um, the gates of hell, Jesus said, will not prevail against my church. So here, the Antichrist, possessed by Satan, is allowed to prevail against these saints, the tribulation saints. So this is not us. We are not there. He is allowed to prevail here. So the rapture has to happen before this. Stick with me here, and I'll, I'll show you more. Um, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So the whole world, every, so this is a global system. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone who's, 
And there's a qualifier. Everyone whose name is not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life and of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. So, so everybody but those whose name is written before the foundation of the world. So whose names are written before the foundation of the world? Well, we can take a quick look here. Let's pause here and I'll show it to you. And you can fight amongst yourselves. People hate this and they chafe with it, but it's in the Bible. I have flipped to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm batting all this into your court to do research. Be the Berean. Don't just take my word for it or whatever. So Ephesians chapter 1, this is written by Paul. Paul an apostle, Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ. Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Amen. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Not your will, not my will, according to the purpose of his will. He chose us to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now I've already offended the Reformed camp and now I've already offended many evangelicals in the free grace or in the Armenian camps. But I'm just giving you scripture. You guys figure it out, work it out on your own with prayer, okay? So in Revelation in Revelation chapter 13, so the this beast is allowed to make war and to prevail over um, everyone, everyone who dwells on the earth, and everyone's going to worship it, whose name is not, whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life um, of the Lamb who is slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be um, taken captive in verse 10, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here's a call for endurance and faith of the saints, the tribulation saints. Then, okay, now here's where we're going to clarify again the abomination of desolation. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So it's a demon-possessed, probably chief demons in that one, because we know Satan himself is in the first beast. This is the second beast. It exercises, another it, all authority of the first beast in its presence. It exercises its authority. I'm sure they've been laying these plans for millennia. Um, and makes the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast. So he's like the fake Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit points to Christ and says, everybody worship the Holy Spirit and he glorifies him. This is like the fake Holy Spirit and, and it's the false prophet, okay? Um, so he makes everybody worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So this clarifies that there was a mortal wound and it was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. I'm sure this is by permission from God, because God is the one who sends a strong delusion, and God is the one who gives permission for this delusion to happen. This is judgment on earth. This is God's wrath on earth, and part of his wrath. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. Deceives those who dwell on the earth. Telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So that's what happens to those who are the cold, the called, or rather, and those who are predestined, those who are chosen before the foundation of the world. And, and there are those saints among this number here in uh, during the tribulation and those who are the call of those who are chosen are not going to take the image of the beast, so they're going to be slain. Um, and he's going to cause them to be slain. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast and or the number of his name. Now, here's the, here's the thing with the number of the beast. I want to clarify this. Let's look at chapter 14 because there's a lot of confusion here. It's not the mark itself 
or some type of an injection or something like that that sends you to hell. Uh, what does it is the reason why um, you got the mark in the first place, what you had to do to get there to that point. So if you're held down and you're, it's forced on you, doesn't matter. Okay. Or if you're tricked, somebody tricks you into it. Oh, no, I got the mark. No, I'm going to hell. No. Here's what it is. Uh, look at verse 9. And another angel, a third, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his right hand or forehead, he also will drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. So much for annihilationism. Um, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name, because, um, it, it, and there's are more places in, in the, the passage that talks about the, in the book later on when you get into chapter nineteen and chapter twenty. Um, the receiving of the mark comes with worship of the beast. So you have to worship. You have to take a mark. You have to do do this um, worshiping to take the mark or the number of his name, or both, or what have you. Whatever this is, the mark of the beast, there's worship that's tied to it. There are other names for this besides um, the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. Uh, you look in, in Joel and other minor prophets in Isaiah, and in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there are names like, we're familiar with the name Day of the Lord. It's also known as the Day of God, the Great Day of His Wrath. And obviously these are more than just a 24-hour day. Uh, although uh, it's a period of time, it does culminate and reach its pinnacle um, on an actual day when Jesus sets his foot down on, on uh, the Mount of Olives on his return. But even then, we, we really can't say it's, uh, it's on that particular day because uh, at some point it's got to be the um, sheep and the goats judgment. We don't know that it's that day or if it's a week later or what it is, but... Everybody is rounded up, the elect and the lost, and into the valley of decision. And the sheep are gathered onto his right side, and the goats are gathered onto Christ's left. Um, it's also called the, the last days. It's also referred to as a time. There's coming a time. Um, an hour. There's coming an hour. Um, and that's also called a day. So, in other words, it's a period of time, and, and we use these, these are Hebraisms, and they're used frequently in prophetic writings that have referred to this time frame, this full time period here. But there's a type of uh, language that's in there in passages where the language described is um, coming a time of, of wrath and this fierce anger and so forth. We see this in um, Ezekiel 38 starting about verse 17 through about verse 19, his fierce anger and his wrath. That happens, and it happens. He's going to judge the nations, anybody who comes up against Israel. And so you have Gog and Magog coming up against Israel in Ezekiel 38. And God's fierce anger is kindled, and he refers to it as his wrath. Um, and it's a time of a judgment for the nations, and it's, it's for the salvation of the Jews. It's been said that, the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, and indeed it is. It's the prophetic clock has been stopped for them since about 70 AD. They've been booted from the land. The temple was destroyed. There was a, kind of an aborted attempt in 135 to come back, but that was not successful. They were pushed away. The land was plowed under. It became Palestine, as named by Caesar, by his edict. And um, so it stopped. The time has... Um, has stopped. Then you have Ezekiel 36 and 37, dry bones prophecy about them coming back into the land. And that has started, that has begun already since 1948. It's not completely fulfilled. So um, not all of Israel has come back into the land and they don't have all their borders yet. And ultimately they will not have all their borders until the Messiah comes back and establishes all those borders. Um, and he also builds an eternal temple um, as an honor to him. Um, and we see this um, starting in Ezekiel 40 all the way out, several chapters in, in laborious detail describing this temple. And then in Zechariah, I believe it is, uh, where's it Zephaniah? I believe it's Zechariah that talks about how Branch himself, another name for the Messiah, is going to build this temple. 
So that happens. So uh, it's a time of his wrath. Also, we, we have in, um, in Revelation chapter 6, we have, um, uh, you know, in the previous two chapters, we have John up here uh, before the throne of God, and there's the Lamb of God is up there. He pops open one of the seals and opens the scroll part way. And I saw and heard uh, one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So he has a, a bow. Notice there's no arrows here. So he's going to come, and he's, he's going to bring, um, come to conquer, but he's going to conquer out of peace and negotiations and things so far. And uh, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse. Bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that People should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So I think the great sword that's given in this uh, red horse, I believe, is talking about big war events that happened, and this is about Middle East again, and uh, Jerusalem, Israel, where I think we're talking Gog and Magog because wrath is named in Ezekiel 38, in particular in verse 19. So war, what happens with war? It, what happens with war is is you've you've got death and you've got disease, and and uh, famine and all these types of things that happen. So open the third seal. The third living creature say, Come, and I look, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. This is uh, um, emblematic often of, of uh, famine. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, that's a, a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. So there are some restrictions at this point still. Open the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of a fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth. Fourth of the earth to what? By today's numbers, that'd be about two billion people, okay? To kill with the sword, so it's, Creatures, us, that we can be killed with the sword and with famine and with pestilence. Notice pestilence and famine do not kill plants and, and this isn't destruction of countries and continents and so forth. It's people. This is given in terms of people here. Um, and by wild beasts of the earth. So it's not the beasts of the earth either, although I'm sure many will die, but the wild beasts of the earth will be attacking people. Okay. Uh, we opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So we've got martyrs here both for the soul of God and their side. The seals have been opened. And so now they are crying out with the Lord, verse saying, uh, O sovereign God, holy and true, how long before you'll judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So that's why the fifth seal is a judgment of God, because God is going to respond to these cries for vengeance. And he spends the whole rest of the tribulation week doing um, exactly that. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Um, how can they be given a, a robe? Um, that could be because these people are the ones who, when we are raptured, what happens? The dead in Christ rise first, and this includes the martyrs. So the martyrs got their glorified bodies. And we'll look at 1 Corinthians 15 and see, well, let's do it now, right? What does that look like? The martyrs are given their bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, let me pull that passage up. 1 Corinthians 15, resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the body. You read the whole chapter. It's the great resurrection chapter, and it's about Jesus' resurrection too. But then look down at verse 50. Now I say this. This, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the corruptible inherit the incorruptible. So this is what uh, rapture looks like, and this is what glorified, getting glorified bodies looks like. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So we're not all going to die. Some people are changed at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and will be changed. And this is the dead were raised incorruptible, and will be changed. Notice there in chapter 6 here. This has happened. For this incorruptible 
For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, I just want to emphasize that because it's it's very often confused that uh, what happens is is um, this trumpet is later on in one of the trumpet judgments. Well, when the last trump is spoken of, and Paul wrote about this in First Corinthians fifteen, Revelation had not been written yet, so he was not referring to those trumpet judgments. And besides, you've got some, how do you put robes on a spirit? You don't. So these before the throne are those who are raptured because they're dead in Christ. The martyrs were um, slain for their beliefs, and they're before the throne of God asking for vengeance. So the dead in Christ are raised first. Now, not everybody's martyred. We know this, but this is in particular, this is a particular group who he's addressing here. And he's responding to it, and that's part of his judgment. And that's why this seal in this way. Um, so they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Oh, So when you opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. This is described in Ezekiel 38. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth, as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit um, when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, these are all a bunch of events, and the moon would look like black and the, or red, and the sun would look black and shadowy and so forth. Uh, you've got all the great earthquake and all the dust being kicked up, and you also have brimstone coming down and so forth from the heavens. You have all that in Ezekiel 38. There's Gog and Magog, and uh, their armies are, are destroyed on the mountains outside of Jerusalem. So they never make it all the way in in full force, although they're probably lobbing missiles and stuff. They never make it all the way into Jerusalem, so it's a quick battle. Because they're still in the mountains outside, and we're told in Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39, Gog, whoever, whatever world leader that is, and some people say Putin, okay, he'll be Putin-like, I'm sure, Putin-esque, he will be killed on the outside of Jerusalem, up in the, in the mountains outside of Jerusalem. And um, so notice that this is more figurative language. It kind of fits um, 2 Peter chapter 3 about the sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up and every mountain island is removed out of its place not understood to be um, um, literal the sky being rolled up or how long would people be alive after this and the book of Revelation would be done at this point but no it's it's a figurative language it's going to be you know an atomic bombs go off and things and happen and you have mushroom clouds and all of this so this Paul uh, Paul sorry John is describing what he's um, what he's seeing here and how this comes down okay so all this cataclysm is going on in this very brief war with Gog and Magog war. And what happens is you've got these dumbs, deep underground military bunkers. Uh, we've got them laced throughout Europe. I'm sure the Soviets have them too. Well, I know the Soviet Union is gone. It's, it's Russia. Um, the Chinese probably have them, and they've got them in Europe. And I know we have them in the United States. But these deep underground military bunkers, and they drive supplies under their regular trucks. And you can look at YouTube videos of this happening, and you know that there's a network. This is for the elites, people with money who can buy off favors, right? So it says in the kings of the earth, in other words, leaders, presidents, whoever, um, tyrants, uh, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and powerful, verse 15, and, uh, and everyone, slave and free, so they brought some slaves, some of their servants with them because they don't want to have to shout, shine their own shoes if it's the end of the world. Um, so they bring slaves and, uh, and free. They hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. People are hiding all over the place, um, but also in the, in the dumps. And uh, people are hiding all over the place, calling to the mountains and the rocks, follow us and, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. So they know what's going on. Like, oh, this is the wrath of God type of stuff. It's Armageddon, not quite Armageddon, but it is the apocalypse. Yes, the apocalypse, apocalypse is the revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is that. It will hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Sex notice, notice it's the wrath. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? 
So it is the wrath of the Lamb, and they understand it. It's that. And um, John here in Revelation chapter 6 confirms that it's wrath. So let's read from the very beginning. From the four horsemen, the opening of the seals, all the way through chapter 19, wrath, wrath, wrath. You have the seal judgments, then you've got the trumpet judgments, and you've got the bold judgments and intermixed in between. You've got three woes that are going on. So it's wrath, wrath, wrath throughout the entire book of Revelation. Now, about that wrath stuff, we'll take a look. Revelation chapter 3, people hate when I share this because you can't really back out of it. So uh, the church of Philadelphia, the seven churches, if you don't know, they are laid out in kind of a historical order. There were seven actual churches at the time, but these also depict the um, overall church as a whole, the universal church through various phases in history. Um, and here we have the faithful church, and the faithful church is... is um, is the uh, final faithful church, because after that you've got the Laodicean church, and we've got both going on right now at the same time. You've got the lukewarm church going on at the same time as you've got the faithful church. But for those who are faithful, the believers, the hot, not the cold, um, verse 8 of Revelation chapter 3, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut much like Revelation chapter 4, 1. I'll just put it at that way. I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now some people will try to say, no, this applies. There was a church of Philadelphia, so this stuff applies to them. Okay, well, great. Well, you, when we get in and read this, you tell me when these events happened to the historic church in um, of Philadelphia and Turkey back in the day, any century, I don't care. And then please below reference me the history that tells when these events happen because no. And we'll see why. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not. Kind of like many of the sacred name and many, if not all, but many of the Hebrew roots people. Oh, but they're, they are legalists. Okay trying to um, consign us to the law again and tell us if you don't pronounce the name of Jesus or Yeshua or Yahashua or whatever correctly, we're going to hell. Or um, I guess if we're not circumcised, oh, we're not keeping the Sabbath. If we're not keeping the Sabbath, we're going to hell. But you know, it's legalists. They're imposing the law again. Judaizers, okay? Um, there's, I, uh, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you've kept my word. You've kept his word about patient endurance. Let's look at this. I will keep you from the hour of trial. I will keep you. How's he going to do that? I will keep you from the hour of trial. Which hour of trial? Jesus, because this is his words. If I turn on red letter edition right now, this will show as red. Our, our trial that is coming on the whole world. So which hour of trial is coming on the whole world? You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, right? And it's coming on the whole world, okay? And it's this 70th week, this tribulation week. I will keep you from it. What's, what is the purpose of this hour, hour of trial? Uh, it's to try those who dwell on the earth. So, those who dwell on the earth. So, um, he's talking to the church, and it's to try those who dwell on the earth. So, not us. He's, he's, he's going to keep us from it. So, because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, to, do, to try those who dwell on the earth. So where are we? We're not dwelling on the earth. Because it's to try those who dwell on the earth. Do we dwell on the earth now? Well, yeah, we dwell on the earth. But what about the trial that's coming on the whole world? How is it going to do this? See, so he says, I'm coming soon, hold fast that no one may seize your throne. So coming soon. So you mean there's 
more than one coming? Yeah, there's more than one coming. There's there's the, the coming as the bridegroom for the bride, and he returns to the gate. And that's the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition. It's called the taking. That's the name for it. You said there's a great video that describes it and beautifully acts it out, portrays it. It's a docudrama. It's about one hour long. And it's called uh, Before the Wrath. And I encourage you to, to rent that. I think it's available on different sources, you know, um, Prime Video and places like that. And it's a, You should at least watch it if you don't purchase it. But Before the Wrath, and it goes into the Hebrew wedding traditions. So that's what happens is um, the bridegroom is told by the father, go take your bride. No man knows the day or the hour, only the Father, okay? So that was, uh, in part, that is fulfilled with the um, with Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, because it's a two-day feast. It's in part means that, so it's kind of dual meaning there. But it's also a language that is used in the wedding tradition, that because the, the bridegroom did not know when he was coming, only the Father knew. Um, when Jesus came the first time in particular, that had meaning for that. I think it's uh, Philippians 2, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He left his first estate. And when he left his first estate, the only knowledge he had, Jesus had, and the only powers he had, and whatever else he had, Jesus said, all that I have, the Father has given me. He, the Father gave him the powers as he needed it, gave him the knowledge he needed it as he needed it. In his first coming, and he came down in humility as a man, and he came in a lowly estate. Now, after the resurrection, and now that he's ascended, etc., he is back on the right hand of the Father. He knows everything. He knows when he's coming. But this is the language that's used, Hebrew wedding tradition language. The Father looks about the room addition that the Son has, has done, and he says, go take your bride. Um, real quick, I want, I want to take you to, I want to direct you to, okay, John 14. Here in John 14... Jesus is telling his disciples, because he's been telling them for some time now, look, I'm not going to be here forever. There's bad stuff's going to happen. You're not going to like it. It's going to be disturbing or whatever, but I don't want you to worry about it. So he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, you know, good old Thomas, you left Thomas. Thomas again says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Essentially, Jesus here is, is speaking the language, though, that's in the Hebrew wedding tradition. The Last Supper was also part of the Hebrew wedding tradition, the contract that's made between the, um, the the two the fathers, the two fathers, and then the bridegroom and the bride, and there's a, a whole ceremony. This is part of it, but this is part of it as well, and that is that uh, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house, our many rooms, that kind of a thing. When uh, the wedding couple, when the couple, they're betrothed, and... Um, that happens, the bridegroom goes away for a time and he does a room addition to the house. They don't go out looking for apartment hunting or whatever. This is Eastern tradition. They go do a room addition to the father's house, the father of the groom's house. When the father must approve it, he must look through the house to make sure everything is up to standard and looks the way it should look um, with all of his knowledge and experience. And so then he tells the son, go take your bride. So that's the taking. So the bridegroom goes, gathers up his wedding party, which is his best man and all his groomsmen, and they make a big show of going through the town, making noise, banging on things, uh, blowing on trumpets and shouting, and they make their way to the bride's house, and as they get close to the bride's house, um, the the bridesmaids, the virgins, are actually waiting outside, and, and the bride is in, inside, and she's made herself ready, she's clothed in white. She's pure, ready to go. She's got her wedding dress sitting out, and she's got her bags packed. She might be sleeping. Who knows whatever's going on. She's ready. She knows it's been about a year. That's the, the tradition. So they know any day now 
um, it could happen. And they just got to be ready. They got to be ready. It's any day now. They know the season. They don't know the day or the hour, but they know the season. And it sure looks like the season, feels like the season, and they've been whisperings in town and so forth going on. And, and they kind of think, hey, there's some activity going on over here. I'm thinking it might be close or whatever. So they know, and the bridesmaids are there. They've got, they've got their lamps. They've got the oil, and they're ready to light them to join the two parties. Now, what happens is a bridegroom comes. He does not come all the way, just like the rapture. He comes in the clouds. Jesus comes in the clouds. We will see in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Comes part way, he comes as far as the gate, stops there. She goes out to meet him. He comes for her. She goes to meet him at the gate. And then the two parties merge. They go to the father's house. The doors are shut. Um, in, in this case, the virgins are represent Israel. Some are saved, some are not. There is always a remnant. So some are saved, the ones who have the oil in their laps. The ones who don't have the oil, oil represents the Holy Spirit. They're not saved. So they go and they figure out that, oh, no, I've missed it. Many repent. You know, you've got the 144,000, for instance. Many repent, and they go, but the door's closed. It's like, I don't have any way to get up there now. Um, so they, they're locked out. The Father's doors are locked for seven days, not three and a half days, seven days of celebration, seven days of feasting. That's the, the tradition. Not three and a half days, not one day, not two days. Seven days of celebration in the Father's house. There, the doors remain locked. No one in or out. That's the way it is. Same thing here. Does that week sound familiar now? I think the Lord set this up divinely in the past, and the traditions and so forth carry forth, all to paint this picture that we've got here. Okay, so now real quickly, and with this I'll wrap it up. We'll get into the wrath because I'm going really long here, and I didn't mean for it to go this long, but I knew it really kind of would. And that is about the wrath. So we're being saved. We're being rescued from first revelation 3 10 from the trouble that's coming upon the earth um you know just like uh if you if if you go to trial for something you can't and you're whether you're declared innocent or guilty you can't be tried for that again jesus bore our wrath on the cross we're not going to bear wrath on the earth upon the earth thankfully there will be saints during the tribulation who will repent after the fact like the five foolish virgins, some of those, not everyone, obviously. But there will be some who are saved after the fact. Yes, wrath will be falling on the earth as they repent, but not directed specifically at them, even if they are called and are among the elect. So uh, thankfully, they will. Uh, there will be those who are saved. But let's take a look here. This is speaking specifically to the church. This is Revelation 3 and also Revelation chapter 2 are written to church. First Thessalonians is written to the church at Thessalonica. So here at this church, take a look at what's written in chapter 1. I want to show you something real quick. Okay. Um, let's look at verse 10. Now let's look at verse 9. Let's begin at verse 9 of chapter 1. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So these are believers he's talking to here at this church. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who what? Delivers us from the wrath to come. He's not going to get you through it. Not going to have your back. Not going to help you survive it. Delivers us from the wrath to come. And the very specific language we have in Revelation 3.10 in the Greek is terio ek. And it means to be snatched or taken completely out of the way. Terio ek, removed completely from any danger whatsoever. That's what the term means. There are several terms that could have been used there in that language from the Greek. But instead, it's terio ek, and it's the same kind of thing we have here. Now, let's look at um, uh, verse 13 here to this church, okay? Uh, I, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And this is referring to the dead, right? Those who have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Okay? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain um, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. And people will say, no, that's second coming. Um, but I, there's some particular language in here I want to look at. Is, is the second coming? Because he is coming, but it says we meet the Lord in the air. And that's that Hebrew language type of type of a thing. And with the trumpet of God, we, we don't really see. There, there, there are no trumpets in Revelation 19 at the second coming. No trumpets. There's shouting from the angels, but there's no, no trumpets. Of, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, in other words, Paul's heard from God, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or who have died before him, the dead in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an, of an archangel. Um, apparently not all the angels like you have in Revelation 19. And with the trumpet of God. And there's no trumpet in Revelation 19. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. This caught up, in verse 17, harpazo. We get the word rapture from that because in the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, um, which is an old, old version, it, it was the word basically like rapture. Uh, and um, that's where we get the term. But it's harpazo. And that's where we get the term. We mean caught up, snatched up quickly, just like. Revelation 13, taken completely in the interior act, um, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's not, why didn't we wait down here for him to meet us and come down to earth? No, we meet him in the air and so shall we always be with the Lord. Um, if we're going through the tribulation, it's kind of weird because uh, he says in this will always be with the Lord. And he's saying, therefore, comfort one another with these words. I didn't comfort one another, one another with these words. I thought wrath is coming up upon the earth and, and great trouble is coming upon the whole world and, and all this stuff. And Jesus said back at, at the Olivet Discourse, he talked about, you know, this, this great tribulation that's happening. Comfort one another with these words. Holy cow, are you insane, Paul? Chapter 5. But wait, there's more. Chapter 5. But, but, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. He visited them already and told them much, right? So they should know this stuff. You have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now, the thief comes to surprise those who aren't prepared. Um, Jesus spoke of the thief in the night and talked about the days of Noah. Noah is not caught off guard like a thief in the night. He didn't know exactly when it was going to rain, but he kind of knew when the animals were let out of the ark and the Lord said, Noah, go, go get on the ark. Go sit out there. And so Noah waited a time. The Lord shut the door and the rain began. So Thief-like means those who are caught off guard, and that's at the beginning of the trouble. Noah was caught, Noah was rescued, and uh, those who were caught like a thief were at the beginning, before the rain, at the beginning of the flood, the judgment upon the earth. Not the end, like it's shutting the barn door after the horses are out or after the horses have drowned. Same thing here. Those who are caught off guard are going to find themselves in the middle of judgment, in the middle of, of wrath. So the Lord comes with his wrath, the day of the Lord. And um, comfort one another for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, those guys, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. Not nobody will. Not you won't. They shall not escape. We have an escape. Revelation 3.10. It's coming upon the earth dwellers 
because his trouble's coming upon the whole earth. But he's rescuing us, Revelation 3.10. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day, the day of the Lord, should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as other days, but as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Just like the bride waiting for the bridegroom. Let's watch and be sober. First John 3. Who has this hope purifies himself. So purify yourself. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. So again, it's darkness. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and as of the helmet of hope, expectation, in other words, of salvation. We're already saved. It's not going to save people. What is it about? It's about deliverance. We have the hope or the expectation of deliverance. That's what hope means. Hope doesn't mean, see, I hope I get a, a new game for my, uh, you know, my Xbox or whatever for Christmas. It's not that kind of hope. It's expectation. It's love. It's expectation. Salvation. Obviously, they're already saved. He's talking to the church and he's been praising them for their good behavior, their model behavior, and, and so forth. And, and then... Um, so he's talking about we put on the helmet of our expectation of deliverance. We so protect your mind. And we need this today, right? Protect your mind with this expectation we have for deliverance. Praise God. For God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation or deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. You know, he already took the wrath. He died for us. So we're not talking about um salvation here when he's talking about um, for God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation he's not talking about to, to obtain um, et our eternal salvation because he you already know, talked about he died for us so he's talking about the people who the Lord died for okay so for God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we are awake or sleep in other words we're dead We'll live together with him. Therefore, again, he says, comfort each other, build one another up, but edify one another, just as you're doing. Keep doing good stuff. Comfort one another. Comfort one another. Again, comfort one another. Again, it's absurd if we're supposed to go through it and we're supposed to get the wrath of God on ourselves. So we're not appointed to wrath. There's a, a us and them language in here. So with that, I'm going to back out now. I'm sorry it took so long, but... I wanted to get it all lumped in there together. And I hope it's helpful. Hope you're blessed. Um, have that helmet of expectation of deliverance. Expectation of deliverance is what we have in Christ. And um, you know, whether we die first or, or whether we're alive, we're going to go to be with him forever. Amen.